Hey everybody, Doug Gourlay here with Fred Chu and uh, my background, background, my dog Luna is playing in the snow. It, everybody's doing virtual backgrounds on Zoom during this interesting time, so why not bring my pet along with me to a webinar? And <laughs> She's awesome anyway. So last week on our webinar, we talked a lot about interesting first projects that you could embark on to start automating your environment. And one of the key things we talked about was, how do I identify low risk read only projects that have uh, no ability to be destructive or disruptive in our environment? So we can start putting code out there, start automating things, gain a comfort level with this level of automation, and know that I'm doing it in a way that isn't gonna like, you know, right erase my entire network and nuke it. And one of the projects that Fred and I had talked about was how do I create a program that every day backs up my network configurations and puts them into a central shared repository. So that's what we spent some time putting together this week and we've taken and put the code up for everybody to work with. So Fred, why don't you walk us through what you built, how we did it, let's walk through the code, take a look at it, and then talk about some enhan further enhancements we could put into this over time. What you got for us this week, my friend? Sure. Thanks, Doug. Um, so what I'm going to show you is already posted to GitHub. So you can go to the Arista Networks GitHub repo. You'll find this net DevOps examples uh, directory here. And what I'm doing is posting this under the demo folder. So you can see a lot of different cool examples that our field has put together, some customers have put together, and, and the product team has put together to show you guys different examples of what you can do with net DevOps and Arista. Uh, so for this particular uh, session, we're going to go through this nom webinar week one. So this can you, is can you call it nom 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 next time? I should call it nom 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 nom. It'd be Maybe kind I'll, of fun. I'll add that as a uh, <laughs> as one of our little comments here. But I think rosemary a... focaccia the other day, and I I was like nom 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 when I posted pictures of that. You know that sounds pretty nom nom nom. I, I still remember the uh, the paella from from your place from a while back. That's good paella. That was phenomenal. Um, <laughs> but not to have, diverge into the food uh, food world too too deeply. Uh, so, so here we have the repo and you can see it's really simple. We just got a few files in here for you to work with. And this is just trying to get you, people started with what we discussed in that webinar. Uh, so you could get clone this and, and have at it and we'll take you through what exactly is here in this directory. How does somebody get clone? Yeah, it's pretty easy. Actually, let me take you through that. So all you're going to do- I'm going to ask lots of level 101 questions on this yeah, one just to do. be that guy. Yeah, you, you bet. So. So all you're gonna do, first of all, you gotta install Git on your machine, your laptop, your server, wherever you wanna run this stuff. Uh, and then you click on this button here and it gives you this link. So you would just type git clone, git space clone, and then you grab this link. Uh, so I can just, I won't execute it, but I'll show you what it looks like. So you just copy and paste that link in there and then it'll clone oh, the repo for you. That's pretty straightforward. Yep, and that'll, nope. then you'll have a copy of everything we've got up on there. And I see you're using iTerm2. Is, is it fair to say, Fred, could, could you and I do another follow-up session on how you set up your operating environment with what tools you use, what's in Fred's bag? Could we do that? Yeah, absolutely. We can, we I think we know what we're going to do next week now. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Okay. Yeah, generating content on the fly. So, um, all right. So, I'm going to go into this particular directory. So, this matches exactly what I've got here uh, cloned on my laptop. Uh, speaking of what's in my bag, Visual Studio Code is one of my preferred editors, um, which is really, really great project from Microsoft. I uh, love, this, love this tool. Uh, and so I'm going to pop open some of these files that we cloned off the repo. So the first one we're going to look at is inventory. Now, this is one that you would have to customize to your environment because you probably don't have the exact same name switches that I do in my lab. But you put uh, so the inventory YAML file up as a template for them to start with? Absolutely. Yep. Okay, so cool. you can just replace these names with your switch names and, and have at it. You can use IP addresses here if you want. Um, I, we have DNS running for, for the host names in our lab, so we can specify. In this case, I'm going to categorize my different switches. Uh, so we're categorizing spines and leaves, but you don't have to do that. You could actually just have everything fall under one, one big category if you wanted to. Um, so so, so spines, to yeah. understand your hierarchy, it, all is everything, children, yep. devices, spine, yeah. host, and then a DNS, a fully qualified or non-fully qualified, just a DNS host name, mm -hmm. which your DNS host name there would be DMZ-SP1 or DMZ-SP2 dot your FQDN. Correct. Yeah. And so think about this little colon in between is a range, right? So yep. it's going to do, if I did, you know, one colon 100, it would do SP1 all the way through 100. It's a big spine network. 
That would be a huge spine network. I We've got some of those goal. before. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, we do have some of those in our bag. <laughs> Um, so, so that's this. And then under this, so you can see we have this VARS uh, section here. Here's where I can specify. That's not a reseller. That is not a reseller. Okay. No, no. Uh, these are variables. So these are variables that are associated with this particular category, right? So you can see I have, I can specify a different set of VARS, which I have here for leaves versus spines. I happen to have different username passwords for leaves and spines. Um, so I have two different sets of VARs, but then I have this kind of global VARs, which applies to all of the children, right? So everything that's following in here can inherit the variables here. So is this as I get, tab indented then? Yes. So this is YAML and YAML is uh, space, uses space white indent. space. Okay. Yeah. It uses white space to, to kind of create your hierarchy. Okay. Um, so, so that's what's using here. Uh, Ansible also supports INI format. So you can do that if you don't like having uh, spaces be what delineates your different categories. I have to say, I mean, to me, objectively, this looks easy to read and easy to understand. I, I can understand the, hier the hierarchy and the dependencies within it. Um, but I do want to call you out on something, Fred. And I appreciate the comment, but dude, you seriously put your password and username into your code? Are you <laughs> kidding me? Right. You, you definitely don't do this at home, kids. Yeah. Um, but we, we did this Danger. here just, so that, <laughs> right, just to make it clear as an example as to what these kind of parameters are that you need. Uh, you do see the comment here. We really shouldn't be using this field for the passwords in yeah. the clear text like this. It should be using Vault. But, you know, this is just my lab stuff that's sitting behind, uh, you know, firewalls and stuff. And well, it's for, this is for this demonstration is, purposes at this right. point. Uh, right. Could we do another follow-up session then on how to use tools like HashiCorp Vault for uh, privilege account management, credential storage, and things like that? You bet. I think that would be a very, very useful uh, follow-on. I would sure. learn a lot. So yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. my litmus test. If, if I would learn <laughs> a lot, we need to do it as another session. The other thing I'll, I'll kind of point out here that's really nice with a tool like VS Code is, you know, because I've got this hierarchy, I can collapse these things, right? So if I want to, uh -huh. if I want to create, you know, remove some of the, remove some of the details on particular parameters, I can, I can fold and unfold uh, these different levels. Super so I cool. Concentrate on. I, I did not know you could do that. That's yeah. going to, especially when I'm dealing with complex list management or, I mean, I, I could see a scenario in here where, could I add another, I mean, just, I think the answer is yes, but could I add another level under children that would be children data center one or children region US, then data center one, then spine, then leaf, which would allow me to put my organizations here. I see the nod. So th that's a yeah. yes. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. You can, you can go as deep as you want. Um, whatever makes sense for your hierarchy and your, your taxonomy. Uh, you can totally. Do and we know there's somebody like me who's going to then like, over, you know, drink three lattes, uh, number three, and over rotate on like, dude, I've got the perfect hierarchy. It's 18 <laughs> levels and includes security, trust zones, and region, and location, and <laughs> right, right, yeah. It's, keep it's keep totally it manageable possible. for yourself. <laughs> but, yeah, okay. try to keep yourself sane because if you, yeah, if you get too fine grained, it just becomes a bit tough to, to manage. It's not as sharp a tool as C, but you can still hurt yourself if you over rotate on it. For sure. And okay. yeah, then and just imagine the indention levels once you're going that deep. It's going to be pretty, pretty ridiculous. You won't um, see it on an 80 by 24 screen anymore. <laughs> that's for sure. That's okay. For sure. Um, okay, so we got the we got these leaves and spines all here falling here. As I mentioned, these are kind of global variables. So these are parameters that I'm specifying for everything uh, falling under this this children. So what um, are they? What what's happening down here under uh, the, the, the global? I, I see you're specifying a certain HTTP based API connection type. Yeah. So so Ansible connection uh, for network devices. This can be CLI. So Ansible can actually work with the CLI and SSH in and execute the commands like. Uh, a person would, or if you have a nice operating system like EOS, you can leverage the, the HTTP based EAPI. And that's what this is saying here. Use the, the EAPI method to connect to your devices. Um, we specify the, the OS that we're gonna use. So we're going against EOS here, of course. Um, Ants will become and become method are basically saying going into enable mode to run this because we're at the end of the day, we're gonna do a show run and that requires sure. Enable, so. So if you're doing commands like a show interface that doesn't require enable, you could leave this as no. Um, we are gonna use SSL, um, but I did not go through the trouble of creating certs for all of my switches. Uh, that could but you could. Follow on. Yes, okay. you totally could. 
uh, you could create certs and it would actually validate those certs as it goes through uh, all those connections. And I feel like there, so, there's another follow-up in our growing list of follow-ups, right, as we kind of tease this apart, which is how would I design my network architecture to enable me to do this while maintaining a security posture that protects the administrative and management interfaces from the end user networks. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because How do we avoid if I could act, attacks with this? And, uh, yeah, if I could see a light on my switches from my desktop, I feel like I've made a no-no. <laughs> right, right, yeah. <laughs> Directly, if right. If you can make force everything to go through the, the right workflows uh, and you kind of enforce that, yeah. uh, I think that's, that's a, a big win. Okay, so this is the inventory file. Again, for, for end user or for the folks who might be trying to consume this, the things you should really think about uh, modifying here are making sure the hosts match your host environment. Uh, the variables, the username and password obviously would have to match as well. Um, and then I think you could probably leave most of these alone if you wanted to, but feel free to tweak them. Uh, you would have to have eAPI turned on for it to work with the HTTP API access. Uh, if you don't have eAPI turned on, you could make this say CLI and it would work just fine that way as well. And, and Fred, if somebody wanted to lab this up at home, could they do this with uh, EOS containers or EOS VMs running on their laptop, test their code against that in that type of, yeah. type of controlled environment? That's exactly what those are for. And that's a great, great point. So you could use our CEOS lab or VEOS lab, depending on whether you want a containerized or VM based uh, way of simulating network devices and play around with it on there so you don't uh, go against your live device, uh, network devices. And maybe that's another follow-up. How do we fire up a lab with CEUS and VEUS lab? I, I, need a, I need somebody next to me besides Luna who can take better notes on uh, the four I think different Luna can do discrete follow-ups. She, she's pretty solid with it, man. <laughs> so let's go into the playbook now. So yeah. this is, again, a very simple playbook. And all we're going to do is first we just name the playbook. But my playbook is called Backup Device Configs. Um, gather facts here. So off the bat, Ansible will try to just gather a bunch of random facts about what device it's connecting to. Uh, we're just going to skip that for now because we're doing something very targeted. We're just going to back up the configs. Uh, if I were trying to you know, take a look at all the interface names and everything sure. and do something with that, I would make that true. Um, hosts all. So that means everything in this inventory file, I'm going to go against. Everything but, you, you know, grabbed in the inventory file, execute against. Exactly. But gotcha. if I wanted to, I could say just go against my spines, right? Or just go against my leaves. So this is where that hierarchy comes into play. If I want to execute this against a subset of devices, I can specify hosts and specify that subset. So there. it looks back to the variable names you used within your hierarchy you established in the previous inventory file. Absolutely. Okay. That's exactly what it does. Uh, and then I set out the tasks that I want to execute against these hosts, right? And in this case, we're just doing one task, uh, but this could be a whole slew of them if you wanted to execute a bunch of tasks in, in serial here. Uh, we're going to back up the configs. We are going to use the EOS config module. So this is uh, the part of the Ansible modules for EOS that are published on Ansible Galaxy. So you would have to import the EOS modules for this to work. But How does someone do that? So from your Ansible command, you just do Ansible Galaxy uh, Arista EOS. And if you actually go to the Galaxy web page, uh, we could look at that right now. So if I do uh, Ansible Galaxy EOS. Uh, you type faster than my 9600 baud modem. Nice work. <laughs> now, if only my, my home internet connection would, would keep up. So if we go to Ansible Galaxy here, you can see that it'll actually give you the, the, the actual command there. So Ansible Galaxy install EOS. Oh and then it'll just install those modules. Pretty you. straightforward. Yeah. Too, a little too much Fortnite going on in the background over there, Fred? That might be it. I think my, my kids are at home downstairs um, gaming or something. So. Somewhere between Khan go. Academy and Fortnite, somebody's getting educated. <laughs> exactly. So, so there you go. So this is how you can easily just import those modules. So then you get these uh, different EOS modules, such as EOS config, which just gives you a nice, easy way of working with the configs of EOS. Uh, we're just going to say, hey, we want to back up those configs. So that's one of the parameters available to us. And then under these backup options, there are defaults for these. So if you don't specify them, it will just default to using the UPC timestamp and uh, the, the name of the host. But we wanted to be a Which little makes bit- makes a lot of sense, by the way. It's a, it's a pretty decent default method. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, but we wanted to be a little prescriptive here. So here I'm going to say, I want the file name to be just the name of the host. Uh, and again, so anything between these curly braces, the double curly braces, I should say, are variables. So I can you know, specify all kinds of different stuff in here that would create my file name based on 
when I'm running this and what I'm running this against. So I could do file name, date, version, or whatever. There's a there's a list of variables within Ansible that I can use that import into this allow me to dynamically construct the appropriate host name to protect, you know, so that I'm not overwriting an old config and I understand versioning and so on. Yep, exactly. And then directory path by default, it'll just stick it into the directory you're in, but we want to create this backup slash configs uh, file. So uh, this is particularly, I, I've, I've, set up this directory because this will make it work nicely with Batfish in the future if we want to play around with Batfish. And so, I think there's our fifth session we're going to do, uh, my friend. Okay. Validation, validating your configurations before or after you push them. Right. So, so and I'll, I'll just kind of show you real quick so that uh, we know. Uh, if I look in the backup configs directory right now, that's empty, right? So we, just so you know, I'm not, I'm not cheating here. Uh, we haven't Store the configs prior to running the playbook. But so you're really going to run this right now and break something. You bet. You All bet. right. Do a demo, Hopefully lose a break. deal, Fred. <laughs> so let's see. So we've got. Uh, so that's the playbook. I think we've kind of gone through the playbook, and then those are the only two files that that we really need. The rest of the stuff is just readmes and stuff. So I'm going to run the Ansible playbook command. You can see I'm going to specify the inventory file. What does the dash I, I do for me? That just tells me that the, whatever comes after dash I, that's the inventory file I'm using. Okay. If I don't use that by default, it's going to go to, I think, like Etsy uh, inventory.yaml. Okay. But dash I, I specifies to... an inventory file within the Ansible playbook CLI. Yes, exactly. Okay. And so then get playbook... this inventory file, then, then run playbook.yaml. Exactly. Yep. Okay. Pretty simple. So we're going to run that now. This, this might take a, a minute or two uh, while it runs because this is running from my laptop uh, to the lab um, over my, my home network connection. So... But essentially, the, I'm assuming the thing that's is, a VPN, that's SSH, absolutely. that's been yeah, I don't know if you can see the little, and the little lock or the little shield icon there. But yeah, we're we're going over uh, proper VPN. Cybersecurity focused Doug is now asking hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> now, now the other thing to 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 realize here that some folks, when they're first starting off with Ansible, um, get confused on is. Typically, you're running Ansible from a device against other devices, right? So Ansible is actually running on my laptop. Uh, I don't have Ansible running on the, the switches that I'm actually running this against. So there's no agent at this point. It's an agentless implementation you're showing right now. Correct. And, and that's actually one of the strong points of Ansible that I think network folks have gravitated towards because they don't always have a you know, operating system that's so open to installing extensions and agents on. So this allows them to run Ansible playbooks against those types of devices. As well. Could you put an Ansible agent on Arista EOS, Fred? You absolutely could. Um, what would the be the benefit be of doing that? Just while we're buying you time for your, yeah, so, uh, your, uh, the your benefit, extremely fast VPN to execute. I know. So, so there's not a huge benefit, honestly. Uh, it's just that you could, you could get a little bit, uh, you might be able to get a little bit more um, real-time state data. But honestly, Ansible works just fine with or without the agent. Um, I think it's more for cases where you may not have uh, a, an environment that you're, you've got the HTTP access to and, and other things like that. You might want to run the agent. Okay. Um, so here you can see the play recap. We finished. Uh, we changed a bunch of things, which means basically I did something. Uh, Ansible is also what they call item potent. Mm -hmm. um, so if, if you're not familiar with that. Is term, it nil potent too? <laughs> yes. Uh, so what that basically means is if it's doing something that it's already done before, it's not going to bother doing it again. Um, so now if I look and at let my me, Let me th throw an example of that. Yeah. My remote control on my TV. Yep. Have you ever had that smart remote where you press the button and then they get out of sync and the TV's on and the VCR or the uh, VCR, I'm dating myself, and the DVD's <laughs> off and you flip yeah. the button again and the DVD turns off and the TV turns on, that is a non-item potent implementation. It's simply changing the state every time you do it. An item potent one would be TV on, DVD on, and if the TV's already on, it doesn't run. If the DVD's off, it turns it on and gets it to the current state. It was one of the major drawbacks of some of the uh, remote control implementations we've seen in AV environments. Some yeah. of the newer ones have now solved for that. And there's effectively the on off button is changing the state, but you can do a smart remote that turns everything on or selectively turns devices on or off. It's the same model here. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's a great analogy. That's um, my value in this conversation. Fred. <laughs> so I, if I do an LS on backup configs now, you can see we've grabbed the configs of all those devices. 
And could uh, you we'll pop back over here? Could you dump one of those out and let's verify it really really worked? Yeah, there you go. So oh. I, I popped over to, to VS Code, went to that directory, and there is the running oh wait, so now. it's it appeared in VS Code. Yeah, because I have VS Code like watching my whole directory there. So dude, that's awesome. So yeah, awesome. You Good might have now. one of the most complicated switch configs I've ever seen back there with some of the <laughs> Terminator information you're for some of the state streaming work you're doing. Yeah, some of that stuff probably. Probably we should we should little uh, overkill over for here. right now, but <laughs> okay. Uh, it's okay. <laughs> overkill at this level, we'll get there. Don't worry. You bet. Um, but yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Um, anything else our viewers need to know about setting up this environment? Um, and what? It, and again, let's recap on where to go on Git, uh, which is Git. Git where? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> where so, do I go uh, on Git to get to get this? Yeah, so Arista Networks slash net DevOps dash examples uh, is the repo that you're going to want to go for. Again, you just git clone this thing, and you'll have all the files. Actually, all of the, the cool examples that are in here, there's a whole bunch of them. And then um, you're going to want to install Python 3. You're going to want to install Ansible, and then install the EOS module for Ansible. And I think that's pretty much it. You just need those three, three components, and you're ready to go. And my uh, public service announcement portion of this would be a good way to do that is either in a VM or on um, use like Vagrant and create a, a little composable instance for yourself that could be very vanilla, a sandbox to do these things in. And don't be afraid to use VEOS and CEOS lab instances to kick the tires on and try this rather than doing it in prod, okay? Build your comfort level with this technology before you start adopting this technology into production environment. And if you think about what we're doing here, we're read only, do it in a lab, put that lab on your laptop, put that lab in a composable environment on your laptop. We're trying to talk about a series of best practices that give you the guard bands to gain a comfort level with this technology, familiarize yourself so that as you remove those guard bands and move it to a production environment, you have the confidence and the intellectual capital to do this really well for your environment and your organization. With that, thank you all for joining in. This was a little longer than we expected, but I hope it was informative. Uh, Fred and I are totally open to feedback. Uh, we'll pop our Twitter handles up there and email addresses. Feel free to reach out. And thank you for tuning in, and we hope this was useful. And I think we've got four different action items for us to follow up on. So Absolutely. thank you so much. Yep, thanks.